Welcome to Retroality TV Presents Reimagine That with Chris Mann, offering refreshing reality with a retro twist. This week, Chris interviews voice actress and former Gimme a Break star Laura Jill Miller. Then, singer songwriter Normand Otier will explain how he reimagined his reality in our new segment, Reality Reimagined. And, once again, we'll delve into more nocturnal interpretations with our very own dream weaver, Yvonne Reba. And now, introducing your host, Chris Mann. Thank you, Linda Kay, our vintage-voiced announcer and producer. It's so nice to say that again. And hi, everybody. This is Chris Mann. It is so nice to be back for our Season 2 premiere of Reimagine That, the Retroality.tv podcast, where retro pop meets forward thought. We've been on an extended hiatus, but here we are, February 1st, 2013. Uh, Our second season is being shot off with a bang with a very sweet, melodic show about re-envisioning your voice. Our special celebrity guest, you know her as the sweet little tomboy Sam, the original sweet little tomboy Sam. Hello, Alyssa Milano. Laura Jill played the sweet Sam on Give Me a Break. She really was a comic foil for Nell Carter and Nell Carter's character, Nell Harper. She tells us about her journey from Broadway to Los Angeles to law school and back to Hollywood to become a very, very talented, in-demand voice artist who is in, like, every conceivable cartoon and all sorts of other related media. She is featured tonight, February 1st, on Disney Junior's Doc McStuffins, a very special Valentine's Day episode called My Huggy Valentine. She plays Lambie on the show, and Lambie is feeling some pangs of jealousy in this episode, so check it out kind of reminiscent of what her character Sam went through on Give Me a Break when they brought in Joey Lawrence during, I think it was the third season of the show, to play the new sweet little Moppet character. But she never strayed far from audiences' hearts, certainly not Nell Carter's heart. Nell always saw her as her baby, which is why Laura Jill is the only actor, in addition to Nell, to last the entire six-season run of that show from 1981 to 87. And in addition to having still a very recognizable face, she has an even more distinctive voice that she has channeled into a very successful career, bringing little children and little creatures to life uh, in animation and being So her story is really cool. Following her story, we premiere our Reality Reimagined segment with singer-songwriter Norm Otier. He tells about his journey following a physical transformation, a weight loss success that he had, that finally triggered his going after his dream from many, many moons ago to be a singer-songwriter and to perform on stage, which he's doing now. Great story. Check it out. And then we have our resident dream weaver, Yvonne Reba, is back for her second season of journeying through the subconscious, reading dreams, letting us know what these messages mean and how we can apply them to our waking life and our waking dreams. There is a connection between our sleeping dreams and our waking dreams, and we'll explore that this episode and beyond. And starting with Season 2, Episode 1, this is actually Episode 16 of Reimagine That, but our first episode of this season, we are making this show more interactive. We want to include our listeners in our stories, and that's what our Reality Reimagined segment is about. But we also will analyze your dreams with Yvonne. We will, hopefully in the future, have more of an interactive element with our celebrities that we interview. So send me your dreams, send me your feedback, retroality at comcast.net. And also you can check us out on Twitter at RetroalityTV. And we're also on Facebook at facebook.com 
backslash Retroality TV and check out my blog, Retroality.tv is the website. We will be updating you. There's all sorts of good stuff on the site, archived material, so give it a look. Many of you know that I have a very fond, long relationship with Three's Company. My Three's Company book, Come and Knock on Her Door, is now being developed for a uh, reimagined version, hopefully by this fall. And I'm also working on a book about John Ritter. So I've been pretty busy. This will be a monthly podcast for the time being seems like a wise thing to do rather than trying to fit in two or three episodes a month we'll start with a monthly episode and in the meantime we'll banter back and forth on twitter facebook the blog you name it we'll be there stay tuned after laura jill's interview for a very special song her rendition of smile which was written by the way by charlie chaplin and first featured in his film modern times Thank you, Linda Kay, for your wisdom about all things Chaplin and film, for that matter. What a beautiful rendition by Laura. And really, it speaks to the way the audience feels, and I know that she feels about Nell Carter. It's 10 years, as of January 23rd, since we lost Nell suddenly at age 54. It would be about eight months later, in September 2003, when we would lose John Ritter suddenly, also at age 54. So the song really resonates. Also, we've lost some other TV greats in the last month or two. Um, Conrad Bain, who worked on a soundstage just around the corner from Give Me a Break. Different Strokes was on for forever, from 1978 to 86, I believe. And, you know, Conrad Bain was a sweet man. He was unassuming. He was really, I think, an avuncular figure for the kids on the show. Todd Bridges said he was more of a father to him than Todd's own dad. Uh, So we salute you, Conrad Bain. I often joke on Facebook, I'll say, Conrad Bain, you probably think this song is about you. Don't you? Don't you? Don't you? Well, in the case of Smile, I think it's partly about you, Conrad. We salute you. And we also recently lost actor Paul Ainsley, who TV fans know as Jim the Bartender at the Regal Beagle, the first four seasons, five seasons of Three's Company. He was a tremendously successful stage actor as well. Broadway, the whole bit. We lost him suddenly, and I know that he made quite an impression on his Three's Company friends. He gave me a wonderful interview for the Come and Knock on Our Door book, and Uh, rest in peace Paul I spoke with a a friend of Paul's recently they're doing a memorial for him this coming weekend February the 3rd and Joyce DeWitt wrote I am told a beautiful note about how much she loved Paul and uh, it touched Paul's friend and I know it would put a great big smile on Paul's face so smile is also for you Paul Ainsley. And finally, I think it also applies to the way we feel about Larry Hagman. Even though he played the dastardly J.R. Ewing, and what a TV icon that man was, he was at heart. Linda Gray said he was the Pied Piper, which is also what people said about John Ritter. So really, I think Larry Hagman was to Dallas and those friends and family on that show, as John was to Three's Company, Larry will be missed. And I just happened to interview Linda Gray about 10 days before Larry suddenly took a turn for the worse and died right around Thanksgiving. I interviewed her for the February issue of Well Bella magazine. Check it out at wellbella.com cover story plus my lengthy podcast audio interview for them should be posted pretty soon on that site. She is a remarkable woman. Talks about having a grateful heart and living life to its fullest, not taking one day for granted. And we hope that that comes through in our show here. We want to seize the day and I'm so very grateful to have the lineup, the great people that we have involved in our first episode and so great to have you guys back and we look forward to continuing the journey with you.
you. Uh, but for now, let's think of that body, sassy Nell Harper, Nell Carter, and that wonderful TV family of Give Me a Break, a show that needs to come back to Nick at Night, needs to come back to TVs everywhere. So let's do our little part to let people know, Give Me a Break, Give Me, Give Me a Break. Very pleased to segue to the big, bold voice of Nell Carter and the sweet remembrances of Laura Jill Miller. You know, we're really thrilled to have you on the show. I, like so many people, grew up with you on Give Me a Break. And so it's really cool to see that you have this burgeoning career uh, as a voice artist. And, you know, I think your journey from to Hollywood back to the East Coast and back to Hollywood is a pretty cool one. So um, I put I, in a lot of miles. You did? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, let's start with what you've got going on now, which is a lot. Your voice is really everywhere these days. It is. I actually sometimes look at my TV set and go, oh, hey, look, I'm in that (laughs) and that and that. Oh, I'm up up against myself. (laughs) (laughs) And I think I heard myself in that commercial, too. Um, Well, yeah. Right now, um, we're working on the second season of Doc McStuffins, uh which is on Disney Junior. I'm also doing pickups, like finishing up the final season of a new show called um, Henry Huckle Monster, also for Disney Junior. Great. Um, and then uh, I had just recently finished up the second season of Psy Girls. Wow. That's on PBS. Um, that's running. We um, The show won an Emmy its first season. Wow. And I also just finished up the last season of Curious George. So for a while, I was working on four or five shows at once, and, and oh Wink is still airing. Um, Wow Wow Wubsy is still airing. Uh, I think Clifford's Puppy Days is like on DVD and Juniper Lee and stuff. Mm -hmm. And then every once in a while I see all these other ones. You know, I did like an episode of All Grown Up or Hi Hi Puffy Yummy Yumi. And then I see um, I was on the Amanda show for a while and iCarly I did an episode. And um, sometimes I just scroll along the TV and go, hey. (laughs) There I am. There I am. And Give Me a Break still airs in syndication in some markets. I understand Yeah, I didn't know that, but somebody just either tweeted or tweeted or whatever or (laughs) Facebooked or something and said that it's going to be running in Detroit, I think. Yeah. I'm sure it's other places, too. Yeah, Um, it, it should be. It's really a show that I recently rediscovered, and was reminded of how really laugh out loud funny that show was a lot of (laughs) sitcoms were more like ha 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 you know an occasional titter but give me a break had some really big laughs so some guffaws some guffaws (laughs) right well and some gasps to go with the guffaws (laughs) it was an interesting blend of dramatic and really sort of big big comedy so um, I would say we were ahead of our time, but I don't really know that time because I wasn't really paying attention to other shows <laughs> at that time. So. You, you were quite young. Well, let's kind of rewind to you know your earliest days in, in showbiz. Uh, tell me about your earliest sort of dreams to be on stage and how that came about for you at age eight initially. Is that right? Yeah, uh, yeah, well, seven, yeah, something like that. Um, I didn't really have, I mean, I wasn't one of those kids that always said, oh, I want to grow up and, you know, be in show business or be on TV. Mm-hmm. But it just sort of happened. Um, I took piano lessons. I took dancing lessons. And honestly, there was this dinner theater that was opening up in um, Pennsylvania, um, in my hometown. And there was this ad in the newspaper, and it was like a picture of this new theater that was being built, and it was a theater in the round. And I think in my childhood eyes, um, it sort of looked like a (laughs) merry-go-round. And I asked my dad, you know, what this was and what the word audition meant. And he told me, and he's um, regretted it. No, he's regretted it ever since. No. Um, And I went to this audition for the first show that they were doing there, which was The Sound of Music. And I'm sure there were, um, I would say, hundreds of kids, but I don't think there were hundreds of kids Mm -hmm. auditioning in Allentown, Pennsylvania back then. Um, Uh And I got 
uh, the part of Gretel in The Sound of Music. And then literally after that, I did pretty much every show that that theater did. Wow. Um, I played Oliver and Oliver. Um, that was the demise of my earrings. I, I <laughs> wanted my ears pierced so badly, and I told my parents they didn't love me if I couldn't get my ears pierced. And then I got Oliver, and then I had to take the earrings out, and I've never had a pair since. You never um, had? Oh, boy. I was Baby Louise and Gypsy, and I was in Annie Get Your Gun, and Fiddler on the Roof, and um, Hello, Dolly. And, like, I just... Did yes. show after show after show, and I did The Music Man there. Mm-hmm. And then at one of these sort of cast parties, and we used to have cast parties in our basement with hot dogs and, you know, like these huge cast parties. Uh-huh. Somebody had a paper, and I don't remember if it was like, there was this old newspaper called either Backstage or Show Business, and said that they were having auditions in New York for this new show called Evita. Mm. And they um, needed kids. And she was like, you should go into New York and tell us all what a real New York audition is like. Mm -hmm. So I went. And I don't know why. I mean, I don't know why my parents agreed to do this. But, um, (laughs) you know, by then I had been doing dinner theater for three or four years. And I was singing and, you know, performing and stuff. And um, I went to this audition and there were probably like, and I mean this now, 800 kids. Wow. And, you know, you got called in by fives or tens. And you sang Happy Birthday. And you waited and waited and waited. And by the end of the day, it was down to like five kids. And I was one of them. Wow. And then they picked the blondest kids and, you know, said, you know, you, you, and you, and the rest of you, can we have your name and number? And if you don't outgrow the part, are you willing to dye your hair? And Uh pretty much that was it. And as we were calling my dad to tell him which bus we were coming home on, Uh and that was in a phone booth because back then there were phone booths, I heard familiar music in the door next door, and it was music from The Music Man, and I kind of peeked in. Now, mind you, I'm like little, and you know, (laughs) and uh, someone came out, and I said, hey, what are you guys doing in here? And they said, we're auditioning for The Music Man, and I said, can I audition for this one? Like, I know this show. I had never heard of this new show, Evita. And he said, hold on. And then this other guy comes out. Now, this guy is really short. That's all I remember of him from when I was little. And he said, do you sing? And I said, "Uh uh-huh. And he said, do you dance? And I said, "Uh uh-huh. And he said, do you play the piano? And I said, "Uh uh-huh. And he said, do you have an agent? And I said, no. He said, do you have a manager? I said, no. He Uh. said, do you have a headshot and resume? And I said, no. (laughs) And uh, he said, can I have your phone number? And I gave it to him. Uh Uh-huh. Now, I told my mom, and then I kind of got yelled at. No, I didn't really. Um, <laughs> you're not supposed to give your phone number to strangers. Right. And, uh, but by the time we came home, there was a message on the machine to say, could I come in like the next day or, or two days from then to meet Mr. Van Dyke? Now, mind you, that didn't even hit. Like, we didn't even know. Wow. It just didn't enter our brains. First of all, it was, you know, probably from a payphone, um, uh-huh. and it was, you know, on an answering machine, and we just maybe didn't hear the name very well, and it just seemed surreal. Yeah. So we go back in, and I do the scene from The Music Man, which I had just done at this dinner theater. I sing, I dance, I tap dance, I play the piano, wow. and I meet Mr. Van Dyke, you know, Dick Van Dyke from, you know, Chitty Chitty Bang Bang, and I kind of freaked. Yeah. And that guy, that short man who had come out, was Michael Kidd. He's like a choreographer, you know, won Tonys and, um, right. you know, totally a huge guy, which I wouldn't have ever known who he was. We drove home, and literally the entire two-hour trip home, I, <laughs> I said, starlight, star bright, first star I see tonight. I wish I may, I wish I might be in that show with Dick Van Dyke. <laughs> starlight, <laughs> two hours. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the and next day I got a call. And, and your parents um, are going, please cast her. <laughs> yeah, go. <laughs> go already. The next day I got a call, um, and I got called to the principal's office. And, you know, I don't have any idea what went on, you know, behind the scenes with the phone call to my parents at home or whatever. But all I know is I got called to the principal's office. Wow. My dad gets on the phone. And the lady sort of hands me the phone and says, you know, you're not allowed to get personal phone calls in here. (laughs) And my dad gets on the phone and he says, so, kid, you want to go on the road? And I went, yes. And I hung up and I said, (laughs) I looked at the lady and I said, that's okay, I'm never coming back. (laughs) And that was it. That was the beginning of my Uh, history of being in show business. Blow this popsicle stand of a high school. Of of a... Yeah, was junior, it, it, was, uh, it was like sixth grade. Of a junior high school, yeah. yeah. Wow. Goodbye. 
<laughs> so I went on the road, and then we were on Broadway, and then the show closed <laughs> early. Uh-huh. Um, but Dick Van Dyke was amazing, and wow. Christian Slater played Winthrop um, opposite my Amaryllis before he was Christian Slater. I didn't um, know that. And it was just a great experience. We traveled all around the country. We were in Reno and Los Angeles and Chicago and Minneapolis and then um, New York. And it was a really big growing and bonding experience with my mom. And as I was on tour and, you know, you come out to L.A., like then agents kind of see you and casting directors. And I ended up with an agent out here who had an office in New York and Literally, by the time I was back in New York, I was auditioning for things. I had one or two interviews. I had a general, and then a callback, and a callback, and a callback, and I got Give Me a Break. Wow. And there you have it. Wow. I mean, serendipity, it sounds like, you know, just being in the right oh, yeah. place at the right time. And you're 13, 14 when you get Give Me a Break? So- uh, yeah, sir, yes. Oh, wow. And then spent all those years of my formative years with all the braces and bad hairdos. (laughs) How much fun that must be to see when you catch a clip of that. Well, you know, you said you played Oliver, and you were also cast as a tomboy in Give Me a Break, the tomboy Samantha, which I always kind of thought that uh, Alyssa Milano also played a few years later, a tomboy named Samantha on Who's the Boss? And I'm like... Yeah, popular, popular. <laughs> Hello, I've seen that before. So you're great playing off of Nell Carter and Nell Harper, her character. Tell us, you know, about your chemistry with her on screen and behind the scenes. She's called you, you know, my little girl. You guys were quite close, weren't you? Yeah, we were. Um, when I first met her, there was just this thing that happened this spark and um we had a special bond um Mm. i don't know if it had to do with you know just coming from musical theater or something Mm -hmm. um i know that when i was touring in the music man we actually saw her in eight misbehaven and i had pictures of me dressed up as nell carter um with like balloons in my (laughs) bloomers and balloons in my (laughs) costume and later on i had showed that to her but um we just had this special bond I'm um, recently I was just looking back at a few episodes and mm-hmm. when she hugged me or when she you know stroked my hair or mm-hmm. when you know they were it was real it mm-hmm. really was um, oh. you know of probably everybody on the show if you said you know what was it like being on the show I'm probably the only one who would say oh my gosh it was the best thing ever yeah um, Nell had her problems on the set sometimes but i didn't really either see it because i was in school or i was on the good side of her so so she would bring me with her when we would you know go off to denny's and hang out and play miss pac-man and eat fried chicken and <laughs> I love throw it. at people um <laughs> I you know love we it. went to the women's assistance league all the time and had soup um really we went to rj's in beverly hills and for chinese food and i went to her house on weekends and I was invited to her wedding where it was, you know, quote, family only, and she flew me and my mom out. And, wow. Um, yeah, it was, we just, she got me my first dress to go to the Emmys. And, That's so You know, sweet. I just hung out with her all the time, and um, I, I really loved her. Yeah. Um, going to her funeral was sort of one of the biggest uh, kind of milestones in my life. It was like one of those wow, that's kind of the, one of the first people I know who was a big part of my life, yeah. And she passed suddenly at age, like, 54, and the funeral was almost 10 years ago to this day. She passed uh, January 23rd, I believe, in 2003. Does it seem like it's been 10 years? No, no, time has just flown since then. Yeah. So, because that was, I had just come, sort of come back to L.A., right around then and uh, Mm -hmm. no these last 10 or so years have been very busy your co-stars uh lori and kari were there yes we were all there that's sweet um they all the three of us were there um actually a few years ago i went to mort lockman's funeral and boy Mm -hmm. did i see a lot of old give me a break people there it was like a reunion yeah and you're thinking we need to have a reunion but outside of a funeral (laughs) right oh my gosh so I want to ask you a bit more about your co-stars here in a minute, but Nell in particular, I always loved how, you know, your innocent 
sweet Sam played off of her body sassy Nell Harper from the pilot where you were mimicking her shaking her groove thing all mm-hmm. the way up to the one of the last episodes you did when the show moved to New York and Nell came to parents night and is that the episode where she like rolled out of the bed and sort of fell face first well you... I know that that episode was something we had a two-parter where it was going to be maybe like a spin-off or how the show was going to resume for the next season ah. where it was going to be Sam in college and Nell there but, but then that never happened I didn't know that was sort of a, a setup yeah like they moved to New York and it was the whole Joey and Maddie thing and then I came back and then it was going to be the whole Sam in college thing which was sort of like uh, a different world yeah so I'm not so sure if those two things sort of came out of the same idea or I'm not I'm not really sure that's kind of what I had heard same network though so they probably yeah. were like well we've got this Lisa Bonnie thing yeah I, and I have to say the last season of give me a break in particular I really loved I was a freshman in high school and I loved that show I couldn't wait to see it and when it was announced that it wasn't coming back for a seventh season I was pretty darn crushed you know i'd not as crushed as me no (laughs) i I bet i bet you know you were really the only cast member of the show in addition to nell that was on the show throughout the the six-year run um what sort of accounted for you making the cut from season five to six were they really retooled the show okay i i (laughs) wondered about that yeah i'm sure nell had I mean, I don't know what was going on all the time behind the scenes, but um, again, just because of this interview, I was actually looking back at something and I saw an episode where uh, my character was flying to New York or something, and I don't remember the whole rest of the episode, but I remember she said something like, yeah, my baby, Samantha, Samantha's always been my baby, and like, it just... I was coming back. I mean, uh-huh, whatever, uh-huh. I don't know what was or wasn't working with, you know, the New York scene and Joey and Maddie, and I don't know what was going on, but I know that I was brought back and flown back from Pennsylvania wow. eight, like six or eight times, first class, wow. come back, put in a hotel because I was coming back. So and, you, you uh, were flown from New York to participate in the fictional New York of Give Me yeah. a Break. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But I knew what it was like backstage i don't know what was going on you know at the network level or producers level or writing level but i knew what was happening in my life which was you know you're coming back baby and oh oh only nbc had the vision to keep going you know since we're talking about that last season of the show I, i want to mention here just briefly many people have heard throughout the years of nell's struggles her struggles with her weight with addiction at times she was quite candid about that and she certainly incorporated the weight issue into the show when she had a couple of different transformations last year i saw rosie o'donnell on a show i think it was watch what happens live and it wasn't the first time that she really was critical of nell basically saying that she wasn't friendly that sixth season that she said something really awful in regards to the Lawrence brothers' mother. I mean, were you there for any of that? Can you shed no. any light on... <laughs> I, I wasn't. I actually wasn't. Um, all of that stuff, if that was going on, yeah. could have also been one of the reasons I was coming back. Could have been. Because I was to nail, like, peace and joy and, you know, everything that was innocent and my mom and, you know, it was... I know about those stories. I wasn't really there. I know that I had crossed paths with Rosie O'Donnell, and so had my mom, and I know they had talked a lot. Mm -hmm, Um, mm -hmm. But that's, you know, that's it. By then, I was kind of an adult, and Joey and Matt were kids, and storylines, you know, didn't cross that much. But boy, again, like when I said, I saw that one episode, and, you know, I can just look back sometimes, and I can see, I knew what was going on backstage, like in in a certain episode with... The way she hugged me or the way she stroked my hair or who was standing next to whom or Mm -hmm. a look that someone gave. And that was really telling when in that one episode when she said, you know, my baby, Samantha, she's always been my baby. And, and, you know, we had some growing pains, Nell and I. When Joey first came on, I, you know, I was like, hey, who's this new kid on the set? (laughs) Isn't it right? Yeah. I'm I'm not the baby anymore. And, you know, there was an episode about that. And honestly, Mm -hmm. I don't know if it was like life imitating art, art imitating life. I don't really know. The Mm -hmm. writers probably were more in tune to everything that was 
was going on than I knew. Yes. Um, but, you know, I mean, there was a whole episode about, you don't love me anymore, and he's your baby now. And, uh-huh. you know, believe me, that was going on backstage. That really was. Isn't that but, interesting? But, um, you know, we never we never lost it. And clearly she wanted you back. I mean, it, it sounds to me like she just probably wasn't happy with the retooling of the show of moving her and Addie and the Lawrence brothers to New York. and well, the- she might have been. I mean, she might have been at first, and then she wasn't. Uh, or maybe the, by then the ratings had gone down, and then yeah. they were going to just retool it again. And But I, I do know that that's those last two episodes with the two, it was a part one and two, that was going to be sort of the new thing. It was going to be oh, man. about me in college, and Nell was going to be like the house mother or the den mother, and, and um, hilarity would ensue. For sure, as it <laughs> did for six years. And I, gosh, what could have been with that? That. You know, those scenes where she was doing physical bits, she did a, a lot of great stuff with Telma Hopkins, but she also did some really funny stuff with you where you were playing off of her physical comedy or you were just sort of the straight man watching it. How hard was it to keep a straight face when she was doing all of this sort of crazy stuff or, or you know, sassy one-liners? Did, did you ever crack up? You know, it wasn't... <laughs> Her per se that would make me laugh, but it uh-huh. was the when the audience would laugh. When in the beginning, uh-huh. let me tell you, I saw a few episodes in the first or second season where I like would crack a smile and they would uh-huh. have to cut the camera away from me. Uh-huh. And I remember even getting notes going, "Little Miss, you know, don't crack a smile." And I'd be like, "I'm trying, <laughs> it, you know, it's funny." <laughs> but um, but I then have seen a few episodes from the last couple seasons where I'm like, "Hey, I was good." I learned my craft. You did. And you really grew into this young woman on the show. Started out this tomboy with the curly hair. I understand you really didn't like that whole look the first year or two. Uh, Oh, no. I had like this little bowl cut or something. But for some reason, they wanted it curly. Or maybe I had had a perm and they wanted it to look better. I don't know. But I know we just had this hairdresser guy who was... He was a black guy who, you know, worked on their hair mostly, which is different than my hair. And I remember him taking this curling iron that was one of those kind of curling irons that, like, sticks into something. It's not – you don't just plug it – I don't know. Uh And he would would put the curling iron on my hair and and this – steam would come off my head and i'd be like <laughs> hey Lawrence, Lawrence, you're burning my hair and you go no 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 that's just the oils honey <laughs> and i'm like i don't have any oil in my hair and and then you know it, it would feel fine that day but then the next day i would wash my hair and my little bowl cut would be like smooth sizzle, smooth sizzle and then i would have to get all the little sizzly parts cut off and then you know i just like my hair got shorter and shorter and then i i think i finally got a perm and was like no more curling iron well you know it's kind of funny your journey with your hairdo on that show it reminds me a little bit of joyce dewitt on three's company john ritter had said to me you can always tell what season of three's company it is by joyce's hair Oh, yeah, I could always tell. First season, and I had braces. Second season, I had a retainer and curly hair. I yep. think third season, I always wore like a barrette on top or something, or barrettes on the side. I think by fourth season, I had a bob cut. Mm-hmm. And then fifth and sixth, then my hair got long. Then I was all into the, like, the ponytail and the French braid. and Big bangs. Big bangs were very in. And you were on the cover of, uh, what was it, Tiger Bead or one of those, uh, How to Get Laura's Hair? Oh, well, that would be a very bad issue if it was about my hair. <laughs> Well, you know, you had mentioned Nell's good side, and did she have challenges? I seem to recall reading in the first couple of years in particular, she had some challenges creatively with the producers. Were you privy to any of that? Nope, nope. I mean, I knew I knew about it, and the only thing I knew and from a kid's point of view is that new producers came after the second season. New producers. Uh, yeah, I was like, hey, uh, all new people, Hi. Yeah, that was really it. It didn't affect me. Per yeah, se. It was, she was this obviously larger than life performer persona from Broadway. These amazing singing skills, and yet she could do great turns from comedy to drama on that show. Yeah, she was really, really talented. I mean, really talented actress. She could cry on cue. Yeah. Yeah. And that scene, very special episode, that people seem to recall where Joey appeared in blackface and there was this amazing scene between you and Nell, sort of racially charged. What are your memories of that or or doing 
really controversial, sensitive subject matter the few times that you guys did on Give Me a Break. Well, I do remember that episode mostly because that, I think, was the one that had to do with, you know, you don't love me anymore. Yeah, Um, yeah. So that one was close to my heart. And speaking of, you know, Nell and her acting abilities, I totally remember the one where her father died and she brought me back to Alabama Mm -hmm. and she was singing and crying and I was crying and... You know, and and I think wow. yeah, that one that one hit home. Um, but there were controversial. I mean, I think one of our first episodes was about Katie, the oldest daughter, and she had an IUD. And it's like really in the eighties <laughs> they were talking about that, <laughs> right? And, but then you know they go from that to you know me thinking I'm pregnant from kissing a boy. Um, so <laughs> lighthearted. You know, there's reality and then there's not reality. Yeah. Yeah, like I said, maybe we were ahead of the curve or whatever curve there was in the eighties. Well, certainly in terms of the topic of death, I recall Give Me a Break being one of the first sitcoms that really delved into that. Of course, the kid's mother had died prior to the pilot, and there were episodes that touched on that. And then Dolph Sweet, of course, got very ill and passed away during the fourth season. Uh, What are your memories of that? How did that impact you and Nell? I understand she was pretty close with Dolph. Yeah, she was. Um, I mean, I wasn't that close, mostly because when I was a kid and I was at school, when I wasn't in school, most of my scenes were with Nell, and then all my time spent off camera was mostly with Nell. Um, So I wasn't that close with Dolph. Um, I know my mom talked to him a lot. He died over a hiatus, um, so I was back east when that happened, and I didn't get to go to his funeral. Um, But I think that was probably one of the first times, you know, someone who I knew close to me died like I you know at that point in my life no I I don't think I knew anyone who had you know Mm -hmm. not grandparents nothing Mm -hmm. um maybe a pet but but also I was pretty protected like you know he had been sick during the year and again when you're young and and then you're sort of away from it for three four five months I mean it was different when we came back and he wasn't there right but um it was a uh, gradual sort of losing of him in a way yeah, I mean, we knew it was coming. It wasn't like with John Ritter when he just suddenly passed. And No. Speaking of the John Ritter connection, I, I want to ask you here in a moment about Clifford. The Puppy Days, you sort of picked up the character that he had done, and you worked with Henry Winkler. Happy it Puppy a, Days. It was a prequel, actually, I guess. A, a prequel. Because, you know, I was the puppy and he was the grown-up. Well, I want to get into that here in a bit. You also worked near the sound stages of Different Strokes and Facts of Life? Oh, yeah. Well, we were actually almost the same sound stages because at KTTV, Metro Media Square, I think it was sound stages six and seven. We sort of shared, like, some shows taped on Mondays and Tuesdays and some were on Thursdays and Fridays. Mm -hmm. The the rest we were in um, the rehearsal halls. And um, in our, at KTTV, it was Give Me a Break, Facts of Life, Different Strokes. Uh, oh, one wow. day at a time was over in the other sound stage. We had Jeopardy over where we were. We had um, Judge Wapner. You know. Oh my um, gosh! How cool is court. that? Yeah, that was fun seeing all the people coming off and crying. Um, <laughs> Three's Company was there, and then Three the Crowd That's was there. Right. That's um, right. Small Wonder was there on one of those other st- sound stages. Um, Rituals. Do you remember like an old soap opera called Rituals? I do. Um, I do. So yeah, and like our boom guys and like lighting guys and everybody, you know, they all went around to all the different shows and so got to hang out with everybody and you know, we would see everybody backstage because all the sound stages sort of connected to each other with these catacombs underneath and uh-huh. all the rehearsal halls and stuff were connected and yeah, I mean everybody knew everybody and we hung out. Did you ever sort of stop and go, you know what, this is surreal. This is like any kid's dream to be doing this. Uh I didn't really, <laughs> I didn't really? stop and think that this is surreal because I didn't I couldn't compare it to what was real because this was real. That so was real surreal. to you. Well, there you go. Yeah, uh, it wasn't like, oh wow, look at me. I mean, it's just <laughs> what I was doing. It's what you had known since uh, you were eight or nine and then your teenage years uh, in Hollywood. So it was normal for you. Yeah, uh, someone the other day just asked like, gosh, it must have been so different like 
being on Broadway versus dinner theater in Allentown. I was like, no, it was kind of all the same thing, just a bigger scale. Everybody else thought it was different. But to us, <laughs> to a kid, you know, you're just like, you go and you get your makeup on, and you put your costume on, then you sing and dance in front of people and lots of people clap. And <laughs> I mean, people still ask for your autograph at the stage door, whether you were in Allentown or whether you were on Broadway. It all kind of felt the same, just like everybody else made a big deal out of it. Well, you've always come across as very grounded and ironically those different strokes kids had a a very different fate what kept you from sort of going down that path that a lot of child stars especially from the 80s seem to go down my parents good old mom and and dad yeah my parents and you know two older sisters who would beat that no i'm kidding (laughs) um you know uh my parents and family values and Mm -hmm. although i have to say there comes a time in everyone's life where they know what's right from wrong and i chose right you know, believe me, in all those years out there in Hollywood, you know that saying, just say no? Yeah. Mm-hmm. I never had to because no one actually offered me drugs. <laughs> but if I wanted them, I knew darn well where to get them. Yeah. You know, I'm, like I said, I used to say, I just never was in the bathroom at the right time. Right. Like, I saw the people go in and come out a different person, but uh-huh. I was never included Um, And maybe it was just because I seemed so young or, you know, I don't know, or I was protected. I'm not sure. I just know I made choices in my life because I could have made other ones. You could And um, I was a good kid. I just always was a good kid. And and was Nell a guiding force there? I mean, certainly Nell had her own struggles with addiction, but she sounded very maternal with you. Yes, with me, she definitely was. You know, I was her baby. She would protect me at all costs. Well, that's huge. And Conrad Bain, we also recently lost. Anything jump to mind about him? Just a general feeling or a memory of... No, no, mostly just, you know, there's, like I said, there's soundstage we shared and the rehearsal halls. He was just a nice man. Like, you know, saw him around the hall and said, hey. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, I didn't go to, over to his house and play. Uh-huh. Well, what an interesting childhood you had. And then after Give Me a Break, you sort of immediately left California back to the East Coast for college and then law school, and you were a practicing attorney for a while. Tell me about that odyssey and what brought you back to Hollywood. (laughs) Well, okay, so, you know, all those things when I said I was a good kid. I was, and I was sort of an overachiever and, you know, that kind of stuff. And when the show was over, I could have had a choice of staying in Los Angeles and, you know, auditioning and seeing where the next gig would come from. Or the little voice in my head, which was my father's all the time, that said... (laughs) It's like winning the lottery. You only get it once. (laughs) was always in my head. And I was like, okay, well, that was fun. Um, (laughs) I mean, I signed a whole lot of network deals when I was out there towards the end of the run. And, um, you know, I think things would have happened if I stayed in L.A., but I just Mm -hmm. didn't. Mm -hmm. So um, I just went back to the East Coast and went to college like you're supposed to. Mm -hmm. And um, Mm -hmm. I was always ready and willing to withdraw at any given moment. Never thought I'd finish. I had deferred, you know, for a couple of years, and then I went and, like, I was still doing, you know, I would do, like, a TV movie one time, and then I would uh-huh. get invited to do $25,000 Pyramid, and I'd fly back out, and, yeah. and I did, like, summer stock during college, and I just always thought, and something will just pop up again, and then when it didn't, and I found myself towards the end of school, and I went, oh, now what do I do? Now what? I took the LSATs, and I just decided to stay in New York, which was close to my agent, and by then I was doing voiceover commercials and stuff and I just thought well I'll just stay in New York Uh and I picked my law school based on which law school was closest to my agent (laughs) and um, I lived right up near Lincoln Center and I went to Fordham Law and you know went to auditions and still did you know summer stock and stuff during law school and finished law school took the New Jersey and Pennsylvania bars because I thought oh well if I'm going to grow up and be an attorney I'm going to leave New York Mm -hmm. for sure I'll go home and then I took the New Jersey and and Pennsylvania bars and I passed those but I was still in New York and I was still kind of working and then so the next summer I took the New York bar because I said who am I kidding I'm not leaving New York Yeah. and then I passed 
that bar, and then I was still sort of working part-time as a legal assistant because I was still doing summer stock and commercials and voiceovers and stuff. And then one day I was just like, you know what? I should be a real live attorney. I should just try this. And I did it for a while, and not soon enough did I <laughs> realize that I was meant to have stayed in California. <laughs> and I came back out. And uh, sooner than I could have ever imagined, I got a job right back as soon as I came back out here. It and, was um, kismet. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it was. it's my life. It sort of, it was meant to be. And that's when I came right back out and I did like, I got Digimon right, you know, first thing and I was doing the Amanda show for 12 or 13 episodes and, mm-hmm. and that was it. There, started my career right back up again. So this was like the late 90s? 99, yeah. Mm-hmm, 99, mm-hmm. 2000. I came right back out and started work. So your heart really wasn't in law. Your heart was in acting show business and you just decided at about age 30 hey I'm gonna go for my dream again is that kind of how it worked for you I don't know my age yeah you know a woman never tells her age but yeah right. that was right. kind of it is like I was practicing law not real happy schlepping on the subways <laughs> and one cold snowy winter day my friend out here said I said something like I want to come out for pilot season and she said come stay with me and I said oh don't say it twice and she said come stay with me so I did <laughs> and look you have this amazing career as a voice artist, the amount of credits that you have from, you know, network to movies to you've done voices for video games. Is that true? And commercials? Yeah, video games and toys and commercials and yeah. And then all these shows, Clifford and Juniper Lee and Wow Wow Wubsy and Digimon and... You know. And you still, and I'm not just saying this, you, you still look 30. I think you're always going to look young. You have that sweet, innocent voice. You give life to all these cute kids and cuddly creatures. Do you ever have a bit of an identity crisis when you leave the studio? Like, <laughs> wait, I'm not seven. <laughs> well, hey, I have that every day. Do you? <laughs> um, not really an identity crisis, but I got to say, it is pretty fun, like, going to work one day and playing a lamb in a tutu who's a ballerina. Uh, and who sings to the next day playing like this, you know, orange boy monster with big teeth and big claws who flies, you know. Wow. Where else can you do that? So really, this field really kind of gets your creative fires going and it keeps your imagination big. You must have fun with that. It's got to be quite an adventure to do this. It is, it is. I love being creative. I love bringing the characters to life. I mean, the scripts, like on film too, but the scripts are just, you know, black and white words on a piece of paper and Mm -hmm. with just a nuance of our voice we have to bring everything to life and it's pretty cool and you can go into a studio and no one's putting a curling iron in your hair right no makeup (laughs) no hairdos nothing you have to be careful what you wear though you do you you can't wear loud clothes you're right no no uh parachute pants or uh no i mean you actually have to think about it before you go into you do you do yeah because any of those little noises will i'm sure magnify well the other day i was wearing my side girls t-shirt and they were like what is on your t-shirt starch <laughs> and it just i was like no it's just good cotton but it's too noisy <laughs> Well, you're doing so much fun stuff. What's your vision of your career, say, maybe in the next five years? Do you want to get back on camera? Well, that's always open. Um, Right now, I'm quite, quite busy doing voiceover, so there's not a heck of a lot of time. Never far afield. That that would be fine. Um, But more cartoons, singing cartoons. I love singing. Yes. Well, Doc McStuffins, we're singing, you know, almost every episode. And Mm. same with Henry Hucklemonster. We sing in every episode. So, you know, that's my first love. That's what I did when I started musical theater, so. From the music man to working with Nell Carter to singing now, music has been really a through line in your life. Is that your biggest passion, you would say? I think just performing is my biggest passion, but singing really is the thing that, how I started. Mm -hmm. Um, But even through all these many years, I still only know the same four chords on my guitar. (laughs) Well, I have a couple more questions for you, Laura. I I would be remiss if I didn't ask, because I know you're asked this all the time. But just for the record, do you ever keep in touch with any of your Give Me a Break co-stars? Oh, yeah. Well, I did with Nell before she died. Um, Yeah. Lori, who played Julie, um, we see each other quite often. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't see Kari very much. And let's see, pretty much everybody else died. I know, that's horrible, isn't it? (laughs) It is. It's Um, time marches on. John Hoyt, the grandfather... 
Uh, yeah, Howard Morton. He played Simpson the Cop. Dolph mm-hmm. died. I actually have stayed in touch with random people, like the assistant director or a stage manager or the wardrobe person or a makeup person. Like those people I've stayed in touch with. And I love that you have this sweet maternal memory and relationship with Nell. I really am so grateful that you brought that to light here and talked about that because, you know, I remember the E! True Hollywood story that was done on her and the show and you hear these things from time to time from Rosie. Do those two realms of Nell, can they be reconciled? I mean, she was uh, kind of a pioneer in her world. I'm sure she had to be tough in show business, and yet she played Miss Pac-Man with you. Were all those things happening at once? Yeah, her? they were, but I only saw the good parts. I mean, those things were all happening at once, but I was the one who, like I said, who went to Denny's and ate fried chicken with her and, you know, threw peas at people and played Miss <laughs> Pac-Man and went to her house and we had a puppy together that Aww. we took care of and you know she bought me clothes and took me out for dinner and lunch and if she liked you yeah <laughs> she loved you and uh, that was me and my mom mm-hmm. and yeah like I saw some bad things but they didn't affect me so well that's so sweet I, I love that and you know now you are a full-fledged adult I'm sure you get asked from time to time from your young fans who watch you you know and listen to your voice you know, how do I get into showbiz? What advice would you give to a typical teen, tween, young kid? And what advice would you give to yourself if you could go back a couple decades or so and enlighten yourself as a teenager? Oh, boy. Um, <laughs> well, let's see. Okay, that's a two-parter. Two-parter. Advice to kids who want to get into the business. Don't let anybody push you. Make sure you want to do this <laughs> and make sure you're having fun. Not that I was ever pushed into it, but I have seen kids who have been pushed into it. For me, it was like a hobby that I happened to just get paid for. Like I said before, you know, it didn't seem much different from doing dinner theater in Allentown to Broadway. It also didn't seem much different from doing dinner theater in Allentown to like being on a TV show. It was just fun and exciting and I liked doing it and it was the thing I wanted to do. It was my choice and my hobby and I just happened to get paid for it. Um, And kids though, they should also, you know, do stuff at school and be in school plays and take dancing and singing and piano lessons. I mean, a lot of it is being at the right place at the right time and having supportive parents who will, yeah, who knows, like pick up and move and, you know, but you also have to have the talent to back it up. So being at the right place at the right time, but you have to have some talent. And hone your craft along the way. Yes. Yeah. Which sometimes, by the way, you hone your craft on the job. Like mm-hmm, I said, between mm-hmm. the first season and the last season of Give Me a Break, <laughs> I learned not to laugh. <laughs> <laughs> Somewhere along there, I learned that. And let's see, advice to myself. Mm -hmm. Um, To the teenage. Sure, I appreciate everything. Not that I didn't appreciate it, but I guess in my kids' eyes, I didn't really realize, I don't know, kid stuff, grown-up stuff. Um, I didn't realize that things that my parents were going through at the time, they're the kind of grown-up that I am now, but they seem so grown-up, but I seem like such a kid. Time flies, stuff like that. Yeah, really just appreciate what's going on at the time that it's going on because Mm -hmm. nothing's forever and as we can see yes and certainly appreciate those special people in your life as you did Nell and in closing is there anything else you would like people to know about the give me a break experience about Nell Carter just about that whole amazing phenomenon of give me a break what do I want people to know how come we're not on Nick at Night? No, that that is a good question. That is a good question. Somebody owns the rights to this darn show, and somebody's not letting somebody show it. I mean, it seems like we're the only show from the 80s that's not on. It's true. Um, well, and let's hope that changes soon. What well, our little show will do its little part to remind yeah, people. Yeah, we'll get a grassroots, you know, <laughs> movement. <laughs> we will start a petition. <laughs> Um, let's see. Overall, no. I mean, it was just, it was a great experience for me. Sort of what you saw, what mm-hmm. you saw is what you get. No, what you, what's that saying? What you saw is what you got. What um, you saw, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, what you saw with me and Nell in, especially those first two seasons with all those storylines about us. I mean, uh, we, I loved her, you know. Yeah. Uh, it was great. And then even at the end, when, like I said, when she said, I, I was always her baby, oh. um, we just had a really special bond. And, I mean, the whole experience for me was just amazing. I mean, I was just kid from Allentown, Pennsylvania, got flown out to California, you know, put up in a hotel, and all of a sudden I'm on a TV show. 
I mean, yeah, I remember amazing. just, you know, even taping the first one, that just seemed like, oh, look, we're just taping a show in front of a live audience. But by the time the first episode aired, like literally the next day I was signing autographs. Literally. Wow. And that was just freaky. That was just freaky and how people treated me differently. Uh-huh, um, even though uh-huh. I was just the same kid who was, you know, just yesterday, just a normal person and all of a sudden I'm a celebrity. It, that was kind of a weird sort of thing and a weird uh, probably experience for my parents and for my sisters, mm-hmm. for goodness sake. You know, my sisters, I was just the kid's sister and now all of a sudden, you know, I'm being like mobbed and mauled. And <laughs> well, well, you know, clearly your family had to have been a, a grounding force for you to keep your feet on the ground. I can't imagine a young person being able to deal with that and not get a great big giant head. But uh... Yeah, I don't, yeah, I mean, with, with all the stuff that we got, we got like free things, we got van sneakers and Nike sneakers and Nike clothes and we were invited places and front of lines everywhere and um, we would, you know, go out for dinner at home. We were a family that went out for dinner a lot and like, my dad would count our dinners based on how many autographs I signed that night. <laughs> you know, so that was a seven autograph dinner and... Um, but I'm sure it was a growing experience, too, for my sisters. I know my, my middle sister, people you should talk to her and say, are you Laura's sister? And she's like, she's my sister. I was <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> But, y- yeah, I mean, really, it was... And also, on the just I went home, and I sort of just lived a normal life, and I didn't get all ruled up into this Hollywood culture. And it's not like my parents gave up their life for me and came yeah. out here. I mean... My dad still had his pajama factory, and I went back <laughs> home, and we had pets, and, you know, I was just a normal person back home. That's good. Well, as normal as you can be <laughs> when you're on TV show. Given those exceptional circumstances. Well, it's been a pleasure, and I thank you, and it's so fun to see that you're back doing TV. What that I love. You're doing what you love, and a, a new generation of kids are discovering you through your voice, and hopefully soon they'll connect that with uh, you and Nick at Night rerun of give me a break so we'll work on that well i know the parents know i mean the parents are sort of the ones who maybe grew up watching give me a break and now they have kids and they're um watching these new shows which is just it's great i mean hey if i can just entertain two three four generations that would be cool hey not too bad huh yeah (laughs) Well, thank you again so much, uh, Laura, for your time. Thanks. It's been fun. You were a really good interviewer. Well, thank you very much. You were a great interviewee. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Uh, take and care. And click. No. <laughs> <laughs> right. And click. And we will be looking for you and your voice <laughs> on Disney Junior. Okay. Thanks. And what better way to end our interview with one of the sweetest voices in Hollywood, second perhaps to Nell Carter, who would be so proud of Laura Jill Miller. Here is her rendition of Smile. Smile, though your heart is aching. Smile, even though it's breaking. When there are clouds in the sky, you'll get by. If you smile through your fear and sorrow, smile and maybe tomorrow, you'll see the sun come shining through for you. Light up your face with gladness, hide every trace of sadness, although a tear may be ever so near. That's the time you must keep on trying. Smile, what's the use of crying? You'll find that life is still worthwhile. If you just smile. And what a perfect tune to launch our new Reality Reimagined segment where we talk to you, our listeners, our fellow retro loving dreamers, to get your stories about how you have reimagined and reinvented your life by going after a big dream. If you've hit a certain milestone, a certain major event in your life, whatever the trigger is that's propelled you at any age to go for it. Anything is possible, and that is exemplified with our first guest, Norm OTA. Check out his blog at backtothemusic.blogspot.ca. 
Hi there, Norm. How are you? I'm good, thanks. How are you? I am great, and I'm so excited to have you as our first guest in our new Reality Reimagined segment here on Reimagine That. Well, thank you for having me. Uh, well, you bet. I'm really inspired by what you've done in the last year or so, going after your dream of being a singer-songwriter, something that you've endeavored to do for quite a while and you finally just did it uh, you have your new single to live again which we will share uh, shortly with our listeners but tell me what prompted what sort of triggered you finally going after your dream to make it a reality well strangely enough it was an unexpected trigger a couple of years ago I went on uh, a journey to lose some weight mm -hmm. so it was basically for health reasons and during the course of the year in 2010 when I was dropping the weight once I reached my goal well actually when I was closer to reach the goal weight I realized you know there was something else I've always wanted to do and, mm. and I was like uh, oh yeah I still have music on the back burner yep so that's that's what the trigger was Perfect. So as you were going through this sort of physical transformation, you kind of got in touch with, you know, a, a career or a, a creative transformation as well? Absolutely. It was um, something that started gnawing at my brain again, you know, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And it was also sort of like a, an affirmation that, well, you know, if I, you know, at first the weight loss seemed kind of daunting, but as year went by, yeah. I realized, well, if I could do this... There's no reason why I couldn't go after what I've always wanted to do. I love that. A person's dreams are very potent, and I think when you feel ready to pursue them and get up on stage, what what has that been like for you? Because you've done some public performances. What's it been like to put yourself out there? Oh, that's, that's really interesting. Well, at first it was really terrifying. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, let me tell you, but no, the uh, the live performances came from, um, well, that, that was my next step was to find a singing teacher because I thought, you know, I never really had any training, so maybe I thought it would like push me into getting into that creative mode. Mm -hmm. And I found a, a great vocal teacher in Toronto. His name is Ryan Luchuk, and uh, he's been nothing but positive and encouraging. And he puts on these um, live shows where a select few of us uh, students get to sing with a live band and he just does it because just to give us the experience of doing it great so um, that's how I've had a chance to do it so far well that is so cool and you have a blog up now you have some videos on YouTube uh, what can you tell us how can we uh, find you online uh, well you could just type my name actually uh, one of the uh, videos on YouTube is um, was a uh, live performance that my teacher organized not only singing with a band but with a full orchestra wow. and that was actually pretty exciting I'm, I'm really proud of that one and that everyone who was involved just had a great time doing that one so that I did a cover of uh, Eurythmics There Must Be an Angel yeah and, yeah yeah and that was a lot of fun so that's on YouTube you can find that there um, including my single wonderful so, well yeah. I will make sure that we have the correct spelling of your name at the end of the show here but you mentioned the Eurythmics were uh -huh. they a big inspiration for you back in the 80s what were your creative influences in music. Oh, absolutely. Um, well, we touched on that a bit the other day. You, uh, I've had a chance to think about it. And yeah, you know, Eurythmics and Annie Lennox mm -hmm. truly were very inspiring in my youth. Um, other bands that I used to love were, um, that I still love, are Tears for Fears. Mm -hmm. I used to be a big fan of the Thompson Twins. Oh my gosh. Um, Blondie, ABBA. I think ABBA were just amazing. Oh yeah. And, um, you know, a lot of that good solid music. I mean, to me, some of the best stuff was from the 70s and 80s. Some of the... Absolutely. Just the best songwriting and the best performances. And you're interested in being a singer-songwriter. So you yes. wrote To Live Again. Tell us about that journey and really what the core message of your first recorded single is. Well, um, my singing teacher knew that I wanted to get writing again because I first started writing music when I was involved in theater back in high school. Mm -hmm. I'd actually written scores for a couple of plays. And in between that time and now, I, you know, my teacher was like, well, you know, why don't you try writing again? Then you can start performing your own songs. And that, that actually took a while. He actually had to push me and 
cajole me into doing it because it was, <laughs> you know it was part of going through a lot of these stages of vulnerability that I didn't know I was going to go through. Sure. And and later on meeting the other singers that we end up working with sometimes at live performances, pretty much ninety nine percent of us go through these stages, mm-hmm. and it's all going through these rites of passages. I realize. Mm-hmm. And um, and he actually pushed me to finish the song and he helped me arrange it. And from there, I mean he. Coincidentally, he finished setting up his home studio downstairs at his place, mm-hmm. uh, at his home slash studio, and we recorded the song last fall, and it was a great experience. It's something I've always wanted to do, you know? How exciting. Yeah. And again, we're going to be playing that shortly. Do you have any advice for anyone, particularly over the age of 30, over the age of 40, that, you know, in this uh, American idolized world, where people think that if they don't become big stars or hit it big by the time they're 22 or 25, then that their dream's gone. What inspiration can you give people to let them know that it's never too late? And in fact, it may be right to wait until you're a bit more mature. You know, you're absolutely right. I, You know, strangely enough, when I was in my 30s, I'm 41 now, mm-hmm. um, I already started to think, oh, maybe it is too late to do this and whatever. But after I got healthy and I started feeling better, I thought, hell no, it's not too late. I still <laughs> really, I think the desire became even more strong. So, yeah. you know, I guess my advice would be it's never too late. I mean, if you feel good and you if you still feel like you've got something to give, mm-hmm. there's no reason why it can't be done. And certainly so. as a songwriter, you have much more of life experience from which to draw. And one last question for you. What's next for you? You're working on some follow-ups? Absolutely. I'm, I'm still laying ideas down, but they're going to come, you know, after having lived to live again in the can so to speak Mm -hmm. i i definitely want to see what else i can come up with for sure it's exciting it's not only a creative process but it's definitely a personal process and you're arriving on the other side you have transformed yourself and i think it's an exciting point in your life so thank you for sharing it all with us norm no problem thanks for having me again and can you set up just give us a little bit of an idea of to live again the core message and then we'll listen to uh, your first single well the core message of the song I think is no matter what life throws at you even if you think you've reached the bottom of the barrel so to speak Mm -hmm. you know there's always a chance to pick yourself up and to uh, live your dream you know and it's again you know for me it was time to live again perfect norm thank you so much and your full name is norman otier that's n o r m a n d a u t h i e r that's correct that's absolutely correct so google him check out his blog check out his youtube performances and now check out his first single thank you again norm thank you
supposed to take this I'm only human I'm flesh and blood like everybody else All the ties are broken And all the words were spoken But now I know it's time to live again essential to listen to that little voice within that's telling us to go after our dreams and it's also very important to give voice to our dreams to make them manifest in our daily lives but what about our nightly sleeping dreams is there a connection between those subconscious messages and our daily manifestation of our life's passions our dream interpreter Yvonne Reba who's back for a second season with us at reimagine that thinks there is Check out Yvonne's website at yvonnerybacom She is a spiritual teacher. She is a dream analyst. She has a wealth of information. Check out her site. Send us your dreams if you have one that you'd like for Yvonne to interpret. Here she tells us about a client's crystal clear subconscious vision and how that relates to her waking manifestation of her life streams. Hi there, Yvonne. Nice to talk to you again. Hello, Chris. It's good to talk to you again. Well, Happy New Year, and it's great to be chatting with you again for our first episode of our second season here. So exciting. It is. It's really wonderful. And to think that we're already into the new year in three weeks or so, it's just staggering. January's coming to a close next week. We survived Doomsday a month ago. Oh, yeah. Hopefully now 2013 (laughs) will be... uh, the age of Aquarius, so to speak. We'll get into that later, maybe. Uh, (laughs) What is a great dream that's good for starting the year off with that you can share with us? Right. Well, several people had given me dreams over the last few weeks, but there's one in particular that I've chosen for today, and I think this is a really good one to start the year with because it talks about manifesting your dreams, your thoughts, and so on. Love it. So, and it's a friend of mine. In fact, she uh, phoned me up and said, let's go for lunch. And then when I got there, she said, I have this dream. <laughs> oh, okay, <laughs> okay, fun. So well, I'm happy about that, you know. Oh, yeah, I love it. So this is the dream. There are three women standing, talking to each other. Mm-hmm. They don't seem to be talking about anything in particular. Uh, they're in some kind of an outdoor setting. And then one of them who seems to be wearing a swimsuit. You know how that can happen in a dream. Suddenly somebody's in a swimsuit. <laughs> All of a sudden. Yes. Um, she goes and she there's a little lake or a pond or something, a water anywhere nearby. She jumps into the water and goes swimming. Now, the other two just stay there looking at it. But this woman who has gone swimming is the only one who had this beautiful head, hair, decorated with crystals. Her hair was full of crystals shining, glistening, a beautiful kind of picture of all these different crystals. And uh, how they were in her hair, we don't know, but it doesn't matter. Right. Um, they were just like a headdress almost. And, uh, and so off she went swimming in the lake or whatever it was. Mm-hmm. So the other two just wait. And then after a while, she comes back. And when she steps out of the water, the crystals are not in her hair anymore. They seem to have all flown down, if you like, come down onto her, into her arms. And she's holding them in her arms like you'd hold a baby cradled across her front. Okay. And her arms are full of these beautiful crystals. And she just comes up and stands with the other two and seems very happy. And that's the end of the dream. Short dream. Very short, but very vivid and intense. And when my friend woke up, she thought, this means something, but I'm not sure what. So... I can tell you a little bit about her. She collects crystals. 
She's not one of these people who has hundreds of crystals all over the place, but when she goes somewhere where they, they might be selling something in particular, she buys something unusual. And she has some beautiful crystals in her house, big ones. Wow. And she's a healer. She does Reiki. She does different modalities of healing. And people often ask her if she will help them with the pain or whatever. But she doesn't do it as a profession. She just does it to help people. She's not in that mode of thought where she's making it a profession. She does it because she wants to help. Gotcha. Anyway, so she asked me, well, what, you know, what do you think this is? Now, we've talked about this before, Chris, and see if you can remember. Mm-hmm. What is hair? A head or hair or hat? Anything to do with the head, what does that signify? Uh, m- mental, right? Your, your mind, yeah. your, your thoughts? That's right, absolutely. Mm-hmm. So, uh, first of all, I looked and thought about this dream, and I said, well, two things come to mind. One, the three women actually represent you and two other people. And I know she knows a lot of friends who are also healers in their own way. They're not all the same, but they all have some kind of expertise or ability. Mm-hmm. And, of course, people of like mind tend to get together and talk about their thing and, and so on. So I said, that could be it. I said, but also, it could all parts of this dream are you. So these three women represent your body, mind, spirit. Mm-hmm. Right? Mm-hmm. So the one with the crystals in her hair would represent the spiritual part of her. Mm-hmm. Okay? Mm-hmm. And she's thinking, okay, the thoughts that she has, are shining like these crystals. Now, to her, crystals are healing things, okay? Mm-hmm. And they're also, um, they give clarity, right? We think of things crystal clear. Crystal that clear. That kind of thing, yeah. Mm-hmm. So clarity of mind, of thought, of, of whatever you're focusing on. And when she went swimming, water represents, see, I remember this from the first time we, we talked about the different symbols, the universal symbols in dreams. Yes. That water, large bodies of water especially, represent life, okay? Mm-hmm. Life that you are having at this moment. Mm-hmm. And sometimes people will dream about huge bodies of water, and other times it'll be just a little stream. They may be very happy in the dream, but it represents what their life is like at the moment. Their subconscious is saying, well, you're a big fish in a little pond, mm-hmm. or you're in the middle of a huge movement here in the ocean. And hopefully uh, no sharks are circling. <laughs> well, that's a sig- <laughs> significant thing, too. Right. Watch out for what's happening around you, yeah. <laughs> yep. So, yes. But she went swimming with the crystals in her head, so she jumps into life, gets into it, right? Mm. And when she comes out of the water, the crystals have moved from her head into her arms. Okay, mm-hmm. from head to hands, if you'd like. I Something see. on those lines. I yeah. see. Which would indicate that these thoughts now are need to become action of some kind? Very good. Very good. Okay. Well, when she showed me, remember, I'm actually talking across a table, you know, over lunch. She said, and, and the crystals were in this woman's arms, and she looked like she was holding a baby. So, of course, that was my first thought. You see, now, it's harder for me to explain that to you, but seeing it is easy. So I thought, oh. So I said, so, this woman is cradling the thoughts like a baby. The baby is what is going to happen. It's something about to be born, or it is just born, uh-huh. and it, you know, has to be nurtured. Babies have to be looked after and tended to and all that sort of thing. And then they start doing their own thing. Of course, they grow, mm-hmm. and, and that what hopefully will be happening for her. Mm-hmm. But I, I got the idea that, and just see how you feel about this, I got the idea that this woman has learned a huge amount of stuff over her life. Yes. I think she's in her early 60s. But she's been working on herself for a long time and resisted putting herself out there in front of people because she yes. didn't think that she was as good as other people. Mm-hmm. She knows a lot of healers, a lot of people in the metaphysical world but she's always kind of held back a little bit and thought, well, they know more than I do. Mm-hmm. But this dream is saying, and remember, it's her subconscious and her higher self coming through the subconscious, you have got some wonderful abilities. Mm-hmm. And now it's time for them to manifest into this life, mm-hmm. like the baby being born. I mean, for nine months when you're pregnant, you've got a baby, but nobody can see it. Well, they can see it now in these sonograms, but, you know, I mean, nobody knows really what this thing is going to look like when it's born. So here, when a baby is born, we all say, oh, my God, it looks like the dad or the mom or grandfather or whoever. Mm -hmm. This is time for this baby to come into the world. And this is her 
subconscious saying, you know, you're going to be stepping out a bit here. It's time for you to do this and do it. And don't fear it. It's going to be wonderful. And the other two parts of the personality, the other two women standing, are there to help and support. There's a good feeling around this dream, and that's very important uh-huh. when you wake up, to remember how you felt. How you felt, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Now, in Betty Bethard's book, which I keep recommending, mm-hmm. it's just a small book. It's, uh, it's about dreams. Uh, it's called The Dream Book. Mm-hmm. This is what Betty says about crystals. She didn't say a lot. But she says, energy conductor and storehouse. Mm. Now, energy conductor, that's what you do when you're healing. Right. When people do Reiki or acupuncture, acupressure, and so on. There might be some physical thing here, but there's an energy being released and allowed to travel through the body to mm-hmm. heal. Mm-hmm. All um, right. A movement. Yes, definitely. And she does Reiki. You see, this is one of the things she does. So I'm thinking that this is what her subconscious and her higher self through it says. It's time for you to put this out there into the world and not just to whoever shows up and says, oh, I have, you know, pain. Can you help me with my back or my foot or whatever it is, which he does willingly Mm -hmm. um, without charging anybody. I mean, she doesn't go into that. But this is saying, you know, take it a little bit further now. This is time for you to um, put all of this into a larger area, into a bigger world, as it were. And take it from concept to creation, you know. And, of course, the cradling of the crystals, clearly, that indicates that there has been a, a birth of something. So the whole creative process is one of going from the mental to the material. She's waking up to that calling for herself? Yes. Absolutely. Very well put. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I've I've learned a lot from you, Yvonne. (laughs) (laughs) Well, we all learn from each other, Chris. That's what we're here for. We do. I think. Yeah. You shouldn't stop learning. It doesn't matter how old you are. And I'm learning something every day, too. It's great. But that that was really a very neat dream. It was short, but clear and intense, with some very interesting symbols. I mean, the water, the crystal the way the arms were held, you know, three parts of the personality. I also think that the other two parts could be other women that will help her, because she knows a lot of people. So it's not like you have to do it all on your own. So if you have a dream like this, but you're not quite certain what exactly it's referring to, will you get clues? I mean, should you be just open and aware for a few days or weeks for something important to happen where you can then connect it to the dream? As soon as you ask for things with an open mind, the universe will start sending it to you, all right? Mm -hmm. You know, in the Bible it says, knock and it will open unto you. Mm -hmm. He can, you shall find. I mean, this is not me. This is ancient history. You know, this is stuff that's out there in the Bible and and it's absolutely true. Mm-hmm. When you're ready for it, you know, they say when, when you're ready, the teacher will show up. This is her time. What I find fascinating is our personal dream dictionary, which I think about a year ago, I probably talked about this, is the sum of all of the things that have happened to you in your life. Mm-hmm. That's your personal thing. There are universal symbols like the water, the ocean, and so on, that usually represents the same thing, life in general, or spirit. Like I said, if it's a stagnant pool and you're standing in it, your life is stagnant, and you're not getting into it, and you need to get out of that stagnant pool anyway and into some fresh water. You're soaking in it. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. So when she went swimming, of course, that was really engaging with the water. Mm -hmm. That meant you get into life, you know, a bit like that advert, get back into life. Um, Yes. This is, yeah, kind of like that. <laughs> With yeah, well, it comes to mind. <laughs> I have my personal dictionary, too, you know. Yes. So. <laughs> we all, so well, I, I just I said, that. you know, you're soaking in it. That was another commercial from the 70s. But okay. yeah, you know, I love this. I love the, the crystals and the water. It's a very short, simple mm-hmm. dream, but really yes. profound. Well, you know, I said once, dreams are like onions. You know, they have layers. You take a skin off them, and then you've got another one, another one. That's what you can do with symbols. A symbol can mean more than one thing, so it's very clever when the subconscious uses your symbols that you have in your life, like the crystals for my friend, and so on. And she likes to swim, she loves to go camping, that kind of thing. It uses what she knows and how she feels about it, right? That's her kind of a scene, outdoors, swimming, Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. so on. So it uses that to say, you're happy with this. This makes you feel free. 
you see. Yes. It's, it's got a combination in it that is uh, remarkable. Uh, to, to write all that down takes quite a while, but in one quick flash in the dream, you get everything, you see. You get this whole picture. Well, you know, you've helped us deconstruct a lot of dreams, and I think, certainly for myself, I am now able to start to deconstruct my own, and this has been a a fun adventure. And, you know, in the future, later this year, a big theme for Reimagine That in 2013 are people going after their dreams and reimagining their life. So I love when we talk about dreams that connect to your waking dreams of Mm -hmm. aspiration. So I'd like to explore that theme more down the road, too. Be very fun. Well, just a little P.S. on the end of this. Mm -hmm. I do a study group for my Science of Mind members, and we're doing a visioning circle. Every time we meet, we do what we call treatment, which, you know, is a form of affirmative prayer. Mm-hmm. And, um, but we're doing it for each other as well as ourselves. So when somebody said, I want better health, we see that person in radiant health. We focus on seeing that person. That's our visioning technique, right? I mean, there's more to it than that, but I'm just briefly giving it to you. Sure. But that helps when a lot of people are doing it for each other. It's not just five or ten times as powerful. You are expanding the energy times 10, yes. you know, because we're all focused on it. And it's amazing how these things improve. And we've had some really great success so far. We've just started it at the beginning of the year. So that's a thing to remember for later on. I love it. Well, the power mm-hmm. of prayer, the power of visualizing your dreams, I can't say enough about that. Anyone who's felt something manifest from Mm -hmm. the spiritual or the mental to the physical you know it can happen and going after your dreams listening to your dreams to figure out how to do that and exactly what to do it's it's good stuff so i look forward to chatting more yvonne thank you dear thank you very much chris it's good talking to you Reimagine That with Chris Mann is brought to you by Retroality TV. Copyright 2013 by Chris Mann. You can find us at retroality.tv and at reimaginethat.libsyn.com. Tweet us at Retroality TV or join us on Facebook at facebook.com slash retroality TV. And don't forget to check out our TV channel at youtube.com slash retroality TV. Now, if you'll excuse me, I'm going to finally have that last bit of cake I've been saving in the kitchen since, since, uh, hey, wait, it's not here now. What happened to my piece of the cake? (sighs) 